Can I see this? <laughs> the average American child in 2010, based on the Kaiser Foundation, utilized screens for entertainment seven hours, 38 minutes a day. That is well over 50 hours a week. When my parents were having a hard time uh, dealing with each other because of gaming. I am Dr. Andrew Doan. I spent three years with a mental health team consisting of psychiatrists and psychologists to study the benefits and problems associated with personal technology use, media, and gaming. I will share with you what I know about video games and media. What I am sharing is not rocket science, it's basic neuroscience. At the end of this video, I will share a personal story about video games that nearly wrecked my life. Ready? Let's get started. However, pop culture often describes what we see every day in life. We see kids glued to screens in restaurants. We see teens on couches with their attention focused on separate phones. We see babies with screens because mobile devices are convenient babysitters. Millions of kids stare at screens like the bear in the cartoon. The goal of this video is to talk about the science behind why entertainment, digital media, and video games, which I refer to as digital sugars, are so enticing to the brain and to help you understand what is happening to the brain and body when we are looking at digital sugars. Digital sugars act on the brain and body like a digital drug. What we see and what we hear changes the way our brains activate and control the release of hormones in the body. Research showed that when pleasing music was added to video games, the music stimulated the release of cortisol into the bloodstream. Let's follow the neural and biological pathways. The music stimulates the eardrums and the auditory nerve. The auditory nerve stimulates the auditory cortex to perceive the music. Then the frontal cortex and the higher centers of the brain interpret the music and determine if the music is pleasurable. The midbrain then releases dopamine. Dopamine then stimulates the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus stimulates the pituitary gland to release hormones into the bloodstream that will stimulate the adrenal gland to release cortisol. This is known as the HPA pathway. The amazing thing is that once cortisol is released, it's not only a stress hormone, but it is also a hormone that's a transcription factor that passes through the blood-brain barrier and goes into the cell's nucleus and binds to a cortisol-specific receptor to turn on the transcription of genes. Cortisol will turn on gene expression throughout the body just from the music that is being heard. In this research study, it is shown that when men play video games together, their testosterone is more elevated when playing another human being in contrast to playing against a computer opponent. Let's think about this neural pathway and biological pathway. The games stimulate the brain similar to the previous auditory signals. This increases the midbrain dopamine to stimulate the hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis to now increase testosterone in the bloodstream. Testosterone increases gene transcription throughout the body. By playing video games, you will increase testosterone in addition to cortisol. In this next research paper, when gamers play against other humans, their brain's functional MRI scans light up different than if they were playing computer opponents. This demonstrates that the human brain responds differently when humans are playing games together. This is consistent with the testosterone study that we talked about previously. Also, Dr. Nick Yi, who did his work at Stanford University, surveyed thousands of gamers. Dr. Yi identified the three elements that engages gamers. One, achievements like high scores and leaderboards. Two, immersion like making a person feel they're part of the fantasy world that they can escape. And three, there are social interactions with human players. For decades, games like Doom, Ultima, Civilization, Asteroids, Space Invaders, Missile Command, and others have provided gamers with achievements to reach for and immersive experiences facilitating escape. With the advent of high-speed internet, social interactions with other human beings became possible. Numerous games with the elements of achievement, immersion, and online social play have become multi-billion dollar titles that are the most addictive. 
As a gamer, I know I'm really into the game when my adrenaline is flowing and my heart rate is up and my palms get sweaty. These are physiological responses to games that gaming companies maximize with research psychologists. In 2009, Mike Ambinder, PhD, who worked for Valve, stated that physiological responses to games are the measurements of biological responses, create proxies of player states, are involuntary, and are objective and cannot be faked, and quantify emotions. Can games be titrated to maximize physiological responses and be used as a therapeutic drug in clinical medicine? I met with a company called Applied VR in Southern California. Applied VR are using virtual reality headsets for pain relief during medical procedures. While playing with video games with these VR headsets, patients can feel 62% less pain. Dr. Hoffman et al. at the University of Washington has worked with headsets and a game called Snow World to treat burn victims. In his research, he reports both kids and adults look forward to their burn treatments so that they can have their gaming session with Snow World. Using MRI scans of the brain, Dr. Hoffman showed that pain perception is decreased in the brain while the burned patients were playing the game Snow World. So therefore, similar to medications, there are positives to video games and media when used in appropriate amounts. For example, in this 2007 paper, they showed that surgeons who played video games had better hand-eye coordination than surgeons that did not play video games. In this next paper, when used in appropriate quantities like game playing for one to two hours a day, we can see a reduction in anxiety and depression, like a digital antidepressant. This 2008 paper showed that video games increase attention, memory, and executive control when played in moderation. We also use video games as a training tool for military, law enforcement, and pilots. This next paper is interesting. The researchers used an online game called Fold It and recruited 20,000 gamers online to figure out how the crystal structure of a simian AIDS causing virus folded. The 20,000 gamers solved the problem in a few weeks that was not able to be solved in the lab for over a decade. This illustrates the usefulness of gamification. Gamification is taking something that's boring, like school and work, and adding a little digital sugar to it to gamify it. With gamification, you can get individuals to do mundane tasks and be engaged with learning. This 2017 paper showed that virtual reality games can be used to treat phobias, fears, and post-traumatic stress disorders. There are many positives associated with digital sugars when used in moderation. Are there negatives associated with too much utilization of digital sugars? What will the excessive exposure to digital media do to a developing brain in a child? Let's watch this video together and let's find out. So later in this video, we'll dive into what's happening to the baby's brain as the baby is using this digital media and what's happening to development. But obviously you can see that the, the baby responds to the phone very similar like a digital drug that can basically sedate the child. Uh, what's interesting is that as an ophthalmologist, I also use digital media to basically calm down kids in the waiting room as well as during the exam and also particularly when I have to put in eye drops. Uh, putting in eye drops is very discomforting for kids and sometimes it can actually invoke a lot of anxiety and just like this baby using a cartoon or some kind of digital media that is entertaining and engaging and immersive can actually calm the child down similar to like the, the other modalities that we discussed previously in this video that talked about achieving pain control up to 62% using VR headsets. We can do that also with phones as well and with the devices like what this baby was using. 
Dr. Paracelsus in the 1500s was the father of toxicology. He said all things are poison and nothing is without poison. Only the dose makes a thing not a poison. Keep that in mind that even oxygen and water will become toxic in large quantities. There's nothing in the universe that is not a toxin in high quantities. And this applies to digital media too, especially ones that can stimulate the brain and body like drugs. There's a point where the dosage becomes toxic and becomes potentially damaging to the brain, the body, and the individual. The average American child in 2010, based on the Kaiser Foundation, utilized screens for entertainment seven hours, 38 minutes a day. That is well over 50 hours a week. Millions of children around the world are dysfunctional, problematic technology users. What are the negatives associated with the overuse of entertainment digital media? In this 2015 paper showed that sleep deprivation is a significant problem. Sleep deprivation leads to anxiety, depression, mood disorders, bipolar symptoms, ADHD, autistic symptoms, and even violent tendencies. You can break down and eventually die with severe sleep deprivation. Yao et al. in 2019 showed that individuals exposed to violent video games tend to be more aggressive. In 2018, it was shown when gamers play too much, they had depression, anxiety, and antisocial behavior. This 2015 paper showed that gamers who play in excess will have failure to achieve potential. We're seeing kids who game too much fail out of life. In extreme cases, we see abuse, family abuse and extreme violent behaviors and self-harm in extremely addicted gamers. I am going to discuss the concept of digital sugars versus digital veggies. We have digital veggies like e-textbooks, e-books for classes, email for work and school, English, math, science, foreign language, educational webinars, online lectures, biostatistics, and other academic topics. Digital sugars, however, consist of gaming and social media for fun, videos for fun, ebooks for entertainment, texting with friends, email for fun. Notice how there's crossover on both sides. Therefore, content matters. Technology is just a modality. Technology is the syringe to deliver content. As a physician, I can give you medicine to help you with your blood pressure, or you can steal the syringe and then use a syringe to inject drugs for pleasure. Therefore, content matters. I asked my daughter this question while she was eating broccoli when she was about six years old. Let's see what she says. Hi. How old are you? Six and a half. Okay, Emily, do you like broccoli? Yeah. If I gave you a choice every day and put a huge plate of your favorite candy in front of a huge plate of broccoli, which would you eat first? Candy. Obviously, this is not a scientific study. It's only a N of one. However, the LA school districts did this much larger experiment for us. They spent a billion dollars on iPads, gave it to the high school students. Within two weeks, the high school students jailbroke the iPads and installed porn and video games. So the billion dollar experiment is done. Without monitoring and the proper safeguards, kids without fully mature brains will look at porn and video games, the most potent digital sugars available. What happens when the brain overdoses on super arousing digital sugars? This 2012 paper looked at functional MRI scans on internet addicted teens. The researchers concluded Taken together, the studies show internet addiction is associated with structural and functional changes in brain regions involving emotional processing, excessive attention, decision making, and cognitive control. In a 10 year long study at the National Institutes of Health, researchers showed that brains from ages 5 to 20 matured from back to front. The brain completes maturation by age 25. The immature areas of the brain are color coded in red, green, and yellow. And the back of the brain is where the arrows are. And the front of the brain is where I point the arrows here. The bottom set are images of the brain looking from the top of the brain down. The top set of brains are images of the brain looking from the side of the brain. 
At age five, the most mature areas of the brain is the back of the brain, which is the visual cortex and the somatosensory cortex, which controls touch and movement. The frontal cortex is relatively immature. At about age 16 is when the frontal cortex starts to mature. What's important here is that the visual cortex, as it matures, gets locked in around age 12. Therefore, if we don't intervene and correct vision problems of a lazy eye by age 12, the child will have a legally blind eye for the rest of their life. Let's apply this concept to the frontal lobe and gaming and digital sugars. Hold out your left hand. Imagine this is the frontal lobe where it represents higher executive areas. The benefits of gaming and digital sugars that I mentioned earlier in this video like hand-eye coordination, memory skills, and things people cite that games are good for can be represented by the thumb. Right here, thumb. And then the next finger represents communication skills and then relationships and then empathy and self-control and the pinky represents athletic ability. But it can also represent other skills like music writing composition, dancing, singing, art, editing YouTube videos, public speaking, and more. However, if the child is playing and looking at digital sugars for 7 hours, 38 minutes a day, fold in the other fingers and by the time they're an adult, by age 25, when the brain fully matures, they will be all thumb thinking. The child will be really good with the media they have been consuming, but will be deficient in other critical skills. Similar to the visual system, if this is not corrected by the critical age of development, many essential skills will be severely impaired for the rest of the person's life. The sooner we intervene, the sooner the better. Dr. Victoria Dunkley is a pediatric psychiatrist out in California, and I've gotten to know her over the years, and she's an amazing physician. She's observed that in her psychiatric practice, there is a growing number of kids with media overuse problems and that media overuse is associated with a lot of things we talked about today such as depression, anxiety, suicidal ideations, cutting, mood disorders, bipolar symptoms, sleep disorders, meltdowns, poor grades, poor social skills, ADHD, and autistic symptoms. Interestingly, abuse and addiction to stimulant drugs such as methamphetamines and cocaine have a curiously similar presentation to that of media overuse problems, including mood swings, difficulties in concentration, and a narrow range of interests outside of the substance or activity of choice. According to Dr. Victoria Dunkley in my clinical observations, when digital sugars are removed or drastically reduced, all of the above resolve or get significantly better. If you're looking for a digital fast, I have a video on my channel that talks about how to conduct this digital fast. I recommend that you watch that digital detox video next. I'll place the link below in the description. The World Health Organization included gaming disorder in the International Classification of Diseases, the ICD-11. The American Psychiatric Association states that gaming addiction should manifest several of the following. One, preoccupation with gaming. Two, withdrawal symptoms when games are taken away or not possible. Sadness, anxiety, or irritability would be some of the symptoms. Three, tolerance, the need to spend more time gaming to satisfy the urge. Four, the inability to reduce playing with unsuccessful attempts to quit gaming. Five, giving up other activities and loss of interest in previously enjoyed activities due to gaming. Six, continuing to game despite problems. Seven, deceiving family members or others about the amount of time spent on gaming. The use of gaming to relieve negative moods such as guilt or hopelessness. Nine, having jeopardized or lost a job or relationship due to gaming. What is the impact of gaming addiction to society? In order to be considered addicted to gaming, you have to have five or more criteria. Researchers haven't agreed how many criteria are needed for gaming addiction. Right now, the experts are arguing, is it six or is it seven, eight or more? Is it three or four? Keep in mind that someone who manifests just one or two problems are already having serious problems in their lives. For example, if a person lost their job because of gaming, 
but they haven't had any other problems, that loss of a job can add a lot of stress in their life and cause a lot of problems. As the experts argue over where to turn the dimmer switch to determine if someone is clinically addicted to video games and to get medical insurance to pay for treatment, millions are becoming addicted to video games and digital sugars. Based on research, anywhere from 1.7% to 10% of gamers are addicted. You may hear people saying, well, it's only a small number of gamers. Not really, because on a public health scale, that's huge. So what that means is that 1.7 to 10% worldwide, that's 52.5 million addicted gamers based on more than 3.09 billion gamers around the world. But if the addiction rate is 10%, it's 309 million addicted gamers. That is a major health crisis, no matter how you look at it. I promise to share a personal story. This is my son, Nick. And in the photo, he's about 12. My wife and I noticed that he was losing interest in school. His grades were dropping below a 3.0 GPA. All he talked about was gaming. We reduced his gaming to one hour on Friday, one hour on Saturday, and one hour on Sunday. He basically got three hours a week. One day I walk downstairs and I see him playing at five o'clock in the morning. We had a soccer tournament that weekend. He looked at me and said, Dad, I have to get my game on before the soccer tournament. Otherwise, I can't get my three hours in for the weekend. My wife asked me to intervene and do something because we were losing our son. He only cared about the game. We took it away and we saw a change in his behavior and attitude within 30 days. At first, he was anxious and restless. Then he got interested in school. Within six months, he raised his GPA above a 3.5. Then he decided to try out for the track team and someone gave him a pair of shoes that were two sizes larger. He ran an 800 meters in just a bit over two minutes. The coach said, wow, you could be a four minute miler. Nick joins the track and cross country teams about a year later, he runs a 155-800, which is about a half mile, a 411 mile, a two mile in 905, and three miles in 1448. Nick led his high school team to the very first boys cross country championship in the state of California, which was about 1,000 schools. Nick ran cross country for Liberty University, and for my birthday in 2013, he made this video for me. Hi, my name's Nick Down. Uh, when I was younger, my dad, he wasn't really there for me. He was mostly playing video games, and uh, he got me addicted to it. And ever since then, um, I just played a lot. I got uh, really addicted to online, online, uh, on, just online addiction to everything. and. Then uh, my life came crashing down because that's all I knew. When my parents were having a hard time uh, dealing with each other because of gaming, uh, my mom left and went to Oregon with my grandma. And my mom and I and my little sister, Caitlin, uh, we were just, you know, by ourselves with my mom and pretty much had no idea of, of what a dad was. They didn't divorce, but they got back together and uh, we started living together again and my dad finally quit gaming and then he forced me to stop gaming and I wasn't ready for that. Both my dad and I had to find something else. I found the track, my dad found motivational speaking and companies. I ran my first race, I ran the 550 and I remember uh, dying the last 150 and just complete pain just for complete pain, but it was so much joy because I knew it was over. And from that very moment on, I knew that I had something going for me that I was gonna be a runner. I'm, like, the funny thing is with running is the more pain you inflict on yourself, the faster you go. And it's not about how hard you hit somebody, it's how, how much pain you can take and keep going and keep going and finish through the line. The only thing that's telling you or restricting you is yourself. That you can do it, it's just, you need to tell yourself, you need to be confident, because if you tell yourself you can't, you can't. If you tell yourself you can, you can.
Ever since my dad's been talking about gaming, he's been opening the eyes of people who have not uh, not heard of the topic of video game addiction and online addiction and how it's ruining little kids' lives and and it's really sad. So he wants to help people. Not many people have been talking about it. It's it's awesome. I love my dad and he's 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 shown me that anybody can change. Well, it's easier for my son to throw me under the bus than myself. I understand gaming addiction because I'm a gaming addict. Here's a picture of Nick when he was around six months old. My wife wanted to have a picture of him and me together because I was always busy playing games and she could never get any photos of us. So she puts him in my arms. I barely kiss him. I don't even turn around and I give him back to her. I was busy playing all night on a game called Ultima Online. It was the first massive multiplayer online role-playing game and I was playing about 80 to 100 hours per week and sleeping only one to three hours a night for about 10 years. Based on the research and working with other experts, this is what I recommend. Limit entertainment, digital media and gaming to less than one hour daily. Text less and call people instead. Budget time for daily exercise. Spend face-to-face -face time with family and friends. Allow mature video games for ages 17 and older. Know the signs and symptoms of digital media addiction. Encourage tech-free zones such as the bedroom. Do not give smartphones to children under the age of 14. No digital media under age two during critical brain development. Balance technology use with physical activities like one hour tech with one hour of physical activity and establish guidelines on tech storage and use a lockbox if necessary. This is the innovation of adoption life cycle, also known as the Rogers bell curve. I wrote my book Hooked on Games in 2010. In 2010, there was only about a dozen research papers about video game addiction. Today, there's over 1000 research papers but most of the world is not aware of the research presented in this video. We're still at the early adopter stage. When I mention that video games could be bad, the first thing people do is blame the parents or blame the individual. Most people are unaware that video games can act on the mind and body like a digital methamphetamine or a digital cocaine. Being at the early adopter stage, you can use this information to win. You can raise your kids with limited access to games and digital media to help their brains mature. Your kids will be ahead of other kids who are overusing digital media. Dr. Jeffrey Hansen, a pediatric and adolescent psychologist and I are good friends, and we've published a new book called Digital Drugs and the Struggle for Connection. We've created a free audiobook version on YouTube and the links to the audiobook, printed book, and also the Kindle version are in the description below. Please help me get this message out. Like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications to my channel. Until next time, I wish you health and joy.